Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. We're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of Acts. And we are now in chapter 19. So I want to get started today. There's a lot to get into. Uh, chapter 19 is kind of the, the hardest chapter in the book of Acts to understand. There's some things going on in Acts chapter 19 that are often looked at and people just scratch their head and go, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Well, I do. I think I know what the Bible's saying. I think I can understand here, and I'm, I'm anxious to show you what this says. Uh, this is what people say is the monkey wrench in the book of, of Acts. You know, the thing in the book of Acts, you know, everything seems to be flowing correctly and, and right, and everything's going, and, and you're seeing the transition. Hopefully you remember that I've said, and I will continue to say, that the book of Acts is a transitional book. So you're seeing the transition from Jew to Gentile, and then all of a sudden, boom, Acts 19. And you're like, oh, what do I do with that? So we'll look at that here briefly, but I kind of believe that I need to go back a little bit. I went ahead and draw, drew a bigger map up here today, and I need to go back just a little bit and, well, I guess I'll call it a correction. I don't know if I needed to correct it or not because I don't know if I even said it in the last video, but I want to make sure I say this correctly. Uh, last time, we went through the book of Acts chapter 18, and I finished the chapter, and we were studying about the second missionary journey of Paul, and uh the book of Acts talks about the second journey of Paul, but then it begins the third journey of Paul. So I do not remember if I said anything about the third missionary journey of Paul beginning in Acts. And uh, I might have said, and I don't remember, like I said, I, I do so much I hardly have time to go back and see my old videos. So I don't know if I continued by saying that all of Acts chapter 18 was the second missionary journey of Paul. It's not. Part of Acts um, 18 is the second missionary journey, and then the third missionary journey starts in verse 23. So I wanted to make sure I clarified that. I apologize if I uh, insinuated or if I outright stated that all of Acts chapter 18 is indeed the second missionary journey. It's not. There are one, two, three, four, five, six verses in the end of Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 23 that begin what's called a third missionary journey of Paul. So I wanted to make sure I got that right. So we'll back up today before we're getting started in Acts chapter 19. I want to make sure I put out there the missionary journeys of Paul. So you'll know what they are. Uh, we've been going along, and I, I drew a big map up here today. And of course, you know, I'm not the best map, map, map maker. Boy, uh, <laughs> this looks really dumb. Uh, Greece, you know, doesn't look that great. But this is the best I could do to draw a map of the Middle East. And today I want to show you the, the four missionary journeys of Paul. I want to make sure that I show you the verses of each. But before I do, let me say this. I've said before on these videos that there are four missionary journeys of Paul. And I believe in four missionary journeys. There may be five, and I'll show you that here in a second. But there's a big debate out there, and I found this interesting as I was studying this, that some people say, no, Paul only made three missionary journeys, and they reje reject the, the third or the fourth one, because, of course, that would be him going to Rome in, in chains. So they said that's not a journey, that's him against his will going in chains to, to Rome. But I see it as a missionary journey because he's you know preaching the whole time that he goes. So I believe in four missionary journeys. So there are some that say only three. I'd say most likely the overwhelming majority of Christians believe in four missionary journeys of Paul. And then there are some that believe in the fifth missionary journey of Paul. So uh, as quickly as I can, I put them here on my little phone here, and I wanted to uh, put that out there so that we, we have that, the missionary journeys of Paul. So the first missionary journey of Paul would be Acts 13, 4 to Acts 15, 35. And this would be uh, whenever Paul began, you know, in Antioch. Where's Antioch? Antioch of Syria, over here. And then he uh, went to Pamphylia. Here's Pamphylia. And the other Antioch, there's another Antioch somewhere around here. I didn't draw it up here. Then he went to Lyconia, Lystra, Derby. This is Acts 14, 1 through 23. In Acts 14, 24, well, he passed through Pisidia and Pamphylia again, and uh, down to Italia, and then he went back to Syria. Went back to Antioch. Then we have a period of time before his first and second missionary journey. This would be Acts 14.28. During this time, Paul went to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem. And this, of course, would be chapter 15 in the book of Acts, in which Paul goes to the other apostles, and they all talk about the message that was given to Paul, and they all say, man, it's by grace through faith. 
So it's all about believing, we're saved by faith, grace through faith. Then Paul begins his second missionary journey, and I've tried to put up here the um, verses to show you where they are. So in his second missionary journey, uh, 1536 to 41, he um, embarks on a journey with Silas. Uh, they went to Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. Timothy joins them. Uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy go through the regions of Phrygia. Okay, here's Phrygia. And Galatia. There's Galatia up here. And then on to Troas, Acts 16, 1 through 8. Paul receives a vision, and they call him, Come on over to Macedonia and preach to us. Well, Macedonia is all this area up here. So Acts 16, 9 through 40, and Acts 17, 1 through 14, um, all about that. And then Paul went down to Acacia. Acacia, I think. Yeah, down here where Corinth is. And um, worked in, preached in Athens in Acts 17, 15 to 34. After Athens, he went to work in Corinth, where he met Aquila and Priscilla, Acts 18, 1 through 17. From Corinth, Paul went to Ephesus, probably went on a boat, who knows. And then he took the ship to Caesarea and then went back to Antioch of Syria. Then we're told that he abode there for a while. So the third missionary journey begins in verse 23 of Acts 18. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country. So, he goes back to Antioch of Syria. Then after he'd been there, how long? Well, it says, uh, after he had been there, he spent some time there. So however long some time is, he stayed there. Then he starts out on his third missionary journey. And that's what I didn't make clear last time. I, I should have said that verse 23 begins his third missionary journey. So I, if I said that incorrectly, or I think I just skipped over it. My idea was I just want to get through with this chapter, so let's just keep reading. So I wanted to make sure that I clarify at this time that the third missionary journey of Paul begins in verse 23 of Acts 18. And what we see is him setting off again and visiting the churches of Galatia and Phrygia. So he goes from Antioch up here. He then goes to Ephesus, where he causes an uproar. Now we're going to see this today in Acts 19, verses 1 through 41, and what he deals with and what he has to go through in Ephesus. Uh, he then goes to Macedonia and Greece, Acts chapter 20. We're not there yet, but we'll get more to that. And then he goes to Miletus, and then back to Jerusalem on his third missionary journey. Now, the fourth missionary journey of Paul he is over here in the book of Acts. And uh, I just we'll get to that later probably, but there's here's the verses that I put up here of the different missionary journeys of Paul. Now, why do I say that there could have been five missionary journeys of Paul? Well, these are all in the book of Acts, the first four. And most Christians agree that there were four and that these are the verses of those four. I've looked this up on several websites and these were the verses that they gave. But if you go to the book of Romans, look at what Paul says in the book of Romans. Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 24 and 25, Whensoever I take my journey unto Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Again there in verse 28, he says, When therefore I have performed this, and I have sealed them to you this fruit, I will come to you by Spain. So Paul intended to go to Spain. Okay, Did he make it to Spain? Uh, we don't know. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Paul went to Spain. So did he go there? I, I, I have no idea. Um, if someone knows of some secular source that proves that Paul went to Spain, I'd love to see it. So we don't know for sure if Paul did make it to Spain. Some people say yes he did. Others say well we... We can't find any evidence of it. So we know he went, intended to make a fifth journey. But what is happening here that, that thwarted that that, that, that kept him from doing that? Whether he did or not, we don't know. Well, there was something that Paul did in his ministry that was wrong. He disobeyed God. Now, Paul wasn't a drunk. He wasn't a fornicator. He wasn't an adulterer. He wasn't even married. Uh, he wasn't, you know, this or that or the other thing. Paul loved his people, the Jews, possibly too much. And we will get into this as we get into the book of Acts, but let me just go ahead and tell you what happens so that when we do get there, you'll know what's coming. Paul is doing these journeys, and we've already seen in one of the journeys, Paul says, now I've got to get back to Israel for this feast. I've got to get back to Jerusalem to keep a feast. So even though he says we're no longer under the law, 
he's still thinking in his mind, now there's these feasts in Israel where all the Jews come together, and I just want to see the Jews get saved. So he goes back and he goes to this feast to try to witness to the Jews. Well, Paul is on his journey, and he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, and then he says, now I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. And God visits him in a vision and says, no, you're not. I do not want you to go. Paul, do not go. And Paul says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, if that's not an argument for free will, I don't know what is. But Paul, of his own free will, disobeyed God and went back to Jerusalem. And because of that, and, and what's funny is God told him, don't, don't go to Jerusalem, go to Rome. Go preach the gospel in Rome. Well, he says, no, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm thinking that he was thinking, I've got to see more Jews saved. I want to reach the Jews with the gospel. He ends up going to jail and in chains. He becomes a prisoner and in chains he's brought to Rome. So he eventually ends up where God told him to go. But he, he bucked God. God came to him and said, go here and preach. And he says, no. And he ran from God and went somewhere else. And then God eventually got him where he wanted him to go in the first place. Now I look at that and you know what I think of? I remember Jonah in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Jonah is told by God, go up to this place. And, and, and what's really interesting is Jonah is from Tarshish. Tarshish is the name of the town where Jonah's from. And God says, go to Nineveh and preach. And he says, no, and he got a boat and he went the other direction. And God had to put him through some things before he was able to obey. And, and then go where God would have him to, to go. So, so Jonah was from Tarshish. Paul is from Tarsus. It sounds almost the same. It's a little bit different spelling. And Paul disobeys God. So Paul is a prophet in the New Testament that God told to do this, that, or the other thing. And he rebelled against God and said, I don't want to do that. And God had to put him through some things to get him back into his will. And we see that uh, in the Old Testament with Jonah. It's like, it's like the Bible's a mirror. Many of the things we see happening in the Old Testament, we see something that corresponds that's very similar in the New Testament. I find that very, very interesting. So these are the missionary journeys of Paul. I don't believe in just three. I think four. I, I do count him going to Rome in chains as a journey, as a trip, because it's a trip that he made. He might not have gone as a free man. He might have been in bonds, but he was liberated. He was freed, and uh, God blessed him. But, oh, I always wonder... If he would have just obeyed God, if he would have seen more people saved. Wonder how many people just didn't get saved because he disobeyed God and didn't do what he was supposed to do. I don't know. So the moral uh, uh, or the lesson from that story is don't disobey God. Do what God says to do. He says to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He tells us to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He tells us to, to tell people the truth and to give the gospel to, to people. So, that took all of about 13 minutes to explain. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 19. So I'm not going to read Acts 18 again. I probably should have stopped in verse 22, and then we just started again in verse 23. But just to remind you what happens in 23 and 24, there's a man named Apollos. Apollos was from down here, Alexandria. He had wrong his teaching. So Aquila and Priscilla, verse 26 taught him and expounded unto him the word of God more perfectly. And then he went out and began to preach correctly. And what was he preaching? Well, he was preaching more of the who message because he was showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ, verse 28. So what we're reading here is they're still going to Jews. Even though God has saved some Gentiles and Paul is still seeing Gentiles safe, everywhere Paul goes, he goes to a Jew first. And as we get into chapter 19, guess what we're going to find? More Jews. Paul going always to the Jews. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So Paul was uh, in Antioch of Syria. And then verse 23, 24, 25 of the last chapter tells us he goes up to Galatia and, and, and Phrygia and all these places. And then he eventually comes over here to Ephesus. Now, I drew up here the map. And I didn't put all of the cities that Paul went to. I, just, I basically put the cities that we would be familiar with from reading our Bibles. In our Bibles, we have the, book of, the books of Paul, Romans, Philemon, or no, Romans. Um, after Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Well, here's Corinth. He would have written to them. 
After uh, Cor Corinthians, we have Galatians. All right, here's Galatia. Ephesians, there's Eph Ephesus. Philippians, well, here's Phil Philippi. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Here's Colossae. And so as you're reading the book of Acts and you look at the map, you can see all the places that Paul's been. All right, after Colossians is First and Second Thessalonians. Well, here's Thessalonica. So you're starting to get a picture in your mind of the places that Paul went and why we have in the Bible the letters of Paul and who they were written to. They're written to people that he's been to two or three times. And he started these churches. He's gotten these people saved, and they're all meeting together, and they're studying the Bible. And he comes back and teaches them, and, and he's writing letters to them because they have questions. So that's what our New Testament is from Paul. It's letters written to these different people. So then you have First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Well, First Titus, Timothy, they were men that traveled with Paul as he went to these different cities to preach. So, we find Paul here in his third missionary journey in Acts chapter 19, and he goes to Ephesus. And what happens? Well, he finds these certain disciples. Now, whose disciples are they? Now, that's, that's what's important to look at here. They're not disciples of Christ. They're not disciples of Jesus yet, because they don't even know who Jesus is. And what are they? They're Jews. Look at verse 2. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? So he found certain disciples, certain Jews. And he says, Have you guys got the Holy Spirit yet? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you believed yet and received the Holy Spirit? Look at how they answer. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now, who were these men and how many were there? Verse 7 says, And all the men were about twelve. So here's twelve men that Paul comes across in chapter 19. There's twelve men. These twelve men were Jews. They were disciples, but watch whose disciples they were. Were they disciples of Jesus? No. Were they disciples of Peter? No. Were they disciples of Paul? No. They weren't disciples of any of those. Watch what it says here. Verse 3, And he said unto them, Unto what, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So, they were disciples of John the Baptist. Now look at that. That's way back. I mean, that goes way back. These guys, they had no idea what's taking place in the entire book of Acts up until this point. They went to Jerusalem one time while Jesus was still alive and met a guy named John. And John says, guess what? I'm going to baptize everybody in water because the Messiah is coming. And they said, really? And they started traveling all over the known world, going around to all the Jews, saying, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, get baptized. What was the message of, of John the Baptist? Repent and be baptized. So that's all they knew. And that's all they were preaching was John's message. Now, why, why did John baptize in water? Go back to John chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, or not verse 1, but verse 31. John chapter 1 and verse 31. Because there, John the Baptist tells us why he came baptizing. John chapter 1 and verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So why did John the Baptist baptize with water? To show Israel who was their Messiah. If you continue reading there, you find out that Jesus showed up and says, Look, go ahead and baptize me. And it was so that Israel would see who he was. And what happened? Well, a, do, a, a shape of a dove, which is the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, descended on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And, and then the people that were there watching that, they realized, Oh, it's Jesus. So the whole reason that John the Baptist was baptizing in water was to show people who the Messiah was, and then he showed up and was baptized of him. And he was identified by John the Baptist as the Messiah. And it's interesting, we see the foreshadowing by John the Baptist. The foreshadowing of John the Baptist was, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Holy Spirit inside of him said those words. Well, now we know it's all about the blood of Christ. Now we know it's all about him being the lamb slain before the foundation. So this is all things that later come out, but they weren't being preached by the early apostles. But Paul brings it out, hey, you're justified by faith. You're justified by Christ and his shed blood. It's not the works of the law. So here's all they knew. All they knew was the baptism of John. So all they did was go around and baptize people and say, get baptized, repent, and get baptized because the Messiah is coming. What did Paul say? He said, that's, that's all? You've been baptized unto John's baptism and that's it? Paul says, well, let me think here for a minute. And, he, and, he, and I guess he preached to them, but they didn't get the Holy Spirit. 
So he says, well, what do I do? These, these Jews, they don't get the Holy Spirit. So verse 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Jesus Christ. So what I just told you, the reason John the Baptist was baptizing in water was so that the people of Israel would know, guess who's coming? Your Messiah. Well, he came. Those guys, those 12 people, the Jews that Paul's dealing with, they didn't know Jesus came. They thought he was still coming. They didn't know who he was. And so Paul says, well, let's, uh, let's since you guys are still way back here, the way the book of Acts started out, God dealing with the Jews was Acts 2.38, so uh, why don't you get just repent and be baptized in the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and for the remission of sins, and we'll just uh, we'll take you back to Peter's gospel and, and see what that does. Look what it does. Verse 4, Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, did they get the Holy Spirit as soon as they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? No. <laughs> That's what's so sad. Do you see how this is a hard chapter? Wait a minute, that's not at all the message of Paul that we've seen as we're continuing. The message of Paul is you're saved by grace through faith. It's not water baptism, it's not the law that saves you. Now we get a monkey wrench in the whole deal as we're trying to figure out the book of Acts because all of a sudden Paul goes back and does something that Peter did. He baptizes people in water. Well, did they get the Holy Spirit? No! Look at verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here you have them not getting the Holy Spirit by believing, which we see the Gentiles got in Acts chapter 10. They didn't even get the Holy Spirit until they were baptized. And they were baptized twice! And they didn't even get the Holy Spirit until the hands were laid on them from Paul. Is that the gospel for today? Do we get the Holy Spirit today when someone lays hands on us? No. Does, does the laying on of hands by Paul give us the Holy Spirit today? No, because Paul's dead. How can he lay his hands on us if he's dead? In Paul's epistles, later on in the book of Paul, Paul clearly tells us that the way you get the Holy Spirit is Ephesians 1.13. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise by believing the gospel. It's by faith. So we've got a weird thing taking place here. And it doesn't seem to jive with the way that the transition is taking place, the way things are happening. And so people say, so there you go, Robert Breaker. The way to be saved is water baptism. But I ask you, and I remind you, who is Paul dealing with here? Jews. He's not dealing with Gentiles. This is the key to this passage. Paul is dealing with Jews. Now, it's interesting to me how he has to deal with them. There's so much that Peter does in the early book of Acts that as you read Paul, you see Paul doing the exact same things that Peter did. It's almost like Jesus said, okay, there's two different ways that this thing can pan out. There could be the Peter way or the Paul way. And with Peter, they went to the Jews. They tried to get them to believe Jesus was the Messiah. They, they rejected, and so God said, okay, now you, Paul. And a lot of the things that Jesus did with Peter so that the Jews would believe were repeated in the ministry of Paul. It's almost like Paul is repeating the ministry of Peter. Now, I don't understand all that. I can't explain all of that. All I know is that you don't see anybody getting the laying on of hands anymore in the rest of the book of Acts to get the Holy Spirit. From now on in the rest of the book of Acts, you get the Holy Spirit when you believe, just like we've seen before chapter 19. So you see why people say, well, Acts chapter 19, well, that's a monkey wrench. That, that just blows everything. I don't get it. Why is that there? I'll tell you why. The book of Acts is a transitional book. There are things taking place in the book of Acts. That's why it's very important to not base your doctrine on the book of Acts. Base your doctrine from Romans to Philemon, the books of Paul. And as you read the book of Acts, rightly divide the book of Acts and study and try to get that thing right. So it's very hard to get the, uh, the doctrine out of Acts chapter 19 because this isn't for Gentiles. Remember, Paul said he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Yet here he deals with Jews and he deals with them very differently from the way he's been dealing with people up until this point. So this is a very, very hard thing. Now, I guess I will go ahead and explain this. There are seven different ways that people receive the Holy Spirit or get saved in the book of Acts. Now, people are going to take that probably and put that on YouTube and say, Robert Breaker preaches seven different plans of salvation. I do not. I believe in dispensations. 
And I believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. So as I read the book of Acts, I'm going to show you these seven different places in which somebody gets the Holy Spirit or somebody gets saved. And when they get saved, they get the Holy Spirit. And it's in seven different ways. This is not a teaching of Robert Breaker. This is not some teaching of a man from the 1800s. I'm just going to simply go to the passages of Scripture, so show you seven different ways somebody gets the Holy Spirit. Now let me say this dogmatically. I do not believe that today there are seven different ways to get the Holy Spirit. There's only one way to be saved today, and that is by grace through faith. And when you believe, according to Ephesians 1.13, that's when you get the Holy Spirit, by believing in the gospel of Paul. But there were seven different ways in the Bible that people up until Paul, and even in this part of the ministry of Paul, even though these were only Jews, remember they were Jews, that someone got the Holy Spirit. So here we go. I don't like talking about this, and this is quite confusing, but let me say this. The Bible is not a buffet table. You don't approach the Bible with the idea of, well, I'm going to make whatever doctrine I want, and if I read it hard enough, well, I can find the doctrine that I want. And so you go, well, I want a little bit of this, and I'm going to go over here to this book, take a little bit of that, I'm going to do that. That's not how you approach the Bible. You have to look at the Bible as it was written. You have to rightly divide. So I've tried to teach you the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written, how they correspond with the book of Acts. And I want you to see that according to the Bible, it's toward the end of the book of Acts that we end up finding how the doctrine is finally set in stone for the church age. There's a lot of transition that's taking place before that. And we can't take one of these seven different transitional ways and say, now this is for today. We have to go through the way that Paul says in his epistles. And he's already stated that it's by grace through faith, faith in the blood of Christ and not by the works of the law. All right, so I don't know if I can... I guess I'll make room for this. Seven different ones. Seven different ways. I guess I'll just put it that way. And I'll just give you the verses and let you look it up for yourself. Because I want you to be able to have this. I put these in a note in my Bible. John chapter 20 and verse 22. We're going to look at each one and I'm going to show you. In the Bible, there's only one way to be saved today. I cannot say that enough. Today, in the day and age we live. But before the doctrine was set in stone for the church, that transition was taking place. And in that transition, there were seven different ways that somebody got the Holy Spirit. There are not seven different ways to be saved today. So we must understand that and rightly divide. And we must go to Paul because Paul says today the only way to get saved is through the gospel and believing in the gospel. But in John chapter 20, verse 22, look at what Jesus says. John 20, 22. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Now verse 22, he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And verse 23, Whosoever sends you remit, they will be remitted unto you, and whosoever sends you retained, they are retained. So here is Jesus Christ, and he is just risen from the dead, and he tells his disciples, the Jews, he goes to those Jews and goes, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now you go to the television and, and you watch these so-called preachers today, these big, huge Pentecostal preachers, and they will take that out of context. And they'll say, no, I'm going to give you all the Holy Spirit, so wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> and then he says, that just poured out the Spirit. No, 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 no. We don't find that in Paul's writings. That is not for us today. That is something that Jesus has somehow did in a special way for his disciples. But that's not for us today. So that was Jesus breathing, and they received it. Now go to Acts 2.38. Now later on, we see some people get saved. And Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here's one, Acts 2.38. By baptizing in water, you get the Holy Spirit. Is that for us today? No, it's not. People say, Yes, it is, because in Acts chapter 19, they do that again. Acts 19 was for Jews, and there was only 12 of them. That's a, a separate dispensation, I guess. I hate to even use the word dispensation, but it's God dispensing to them the Holy Spirit in a different way. And it's because it was kind of like they were out of the loop, and they had to get back in the way the Jews got in, so they had to be baptized by that in order to get the Holy Spirit. It's a weird thing, but it's not the way we're saved today. Now... Another way is Acts 8, 14 through 17. 
Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Again, look at this. This is a different thing. Acts 8, 14. So this is why you cannot form and base all of your doctrine in the book of Acts. You must go to Paul. Because there's so many plans of salvation in the book of Acts. So many ways that somebody got the Holy Spirit. And you can't just pick and choose which one you want. You have to understand, it's a time of transition in, until it got to be like this, and this only. And this is the way we're saved today. And according to Paul, it's when you believe the gospel, when you trust, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Acts 8.14 Now when, were the apostles, when the apostles were at Jerusalem, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were to come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet... He was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So here somebody gets the Holy Spirit by laying on of hands. Now, I want you to know why this isn't for us today. These were all Jews. So in the early book of Acts, the Jews were getting the Holy Spirit in different ways. In some places, they got it when they were baptized. Other places, they didn't get the Holy Spirit until someone laid hands on them. So the book of Acts is a rough book, man. There's a lot of stuff going on in the book of Acts. There's a lot of things changing. There's a lot of things. You cannot go to the book of Acts and then take all of the book of Acts and then try to apply it to us. Then you've got seven different ways that somebody can get saved. That doesn't work. It will not work. There's only one way to be saved today. Now, Acts chapter 8, verse 32 to 38. So Acts 8, 32 to 38. Here we have somebody who's not a Jew. He's a proselyte. So I guess you could say in that sense that he, he's tried to become a Jew. Proselyte. I think I spelled that right. So he's somebody that was an Ethiopian. He was a, a Gentile, but he converted to Judaism. So it's going from pure Jews, born Jews, to people who, who converted to Judaism. How does this guy get saved? Well, you can read Acts 8, verse 32 to 38 if you want. And what happens is... He believes, and then he's baptized. So where did he get the Holy Spirit from? Well, he got it by believing. And so it was through faith that he got the Holy Spirit. And then he was baptized after. Now, Acts chapter 10 is another example. Now, Acts chapter 10, though, Acts chapter 10, I believe it's verse 43. Let's go there. Acts 10, 43. Here is the first time a Gentile gets saved. Acts 10, 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in, in, his, in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which believed the word. So 43 and 44. Who was this? This was a Gentile. So a Gentile got the Holy Spirit without water baptism, without laying on of hands. When he believed, he got the Holy Spirit. Now, they baptized him after, but the baptism didn't give him the Holy Spirit like it did in a different time. Well, here we come to the sixth one, Acts chapter 19. You see, up until then, we're starting to see the transition. We're starting to see the change. We're starting to say, oh, okay, for, and, and you cannot just say, okay, so for Gentiles, it's only this way, because here we go. <laughs> here comes Acts 19, and in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, here's water baptism. Didn't get it. So, he, well, let me read it to you again, Acts 19. Look at what he had to do with these guys. Acts 19, and he said to them, We were baptized unto John's baptism, verse 3. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So they got baptized like they did in Acts 2.38. Well, in Acts 2.38, when they got baptized, they got the Holy Spirit. These guys didn't get the Holy Spirit. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they prophesied with tongues and prophets. So they didn't get it, and they were baptized two different times. <laughs> Do you see how there's a lot of differences there? It's like mind-blowing, and you're like, what? So how do we get the Holy Spirit today? Remember, though, that was for Jews. It's almost like these Jews were out of God's plan, and, and they, they ran away from where they should have been, and they, they weren't what they should have been, and... It's like God says, all right, look, I had it planned to do it this way, and you guys weren't there, so let's just go back and pretend like you were back here, and let's do it the way we did it all the way back there. <laughs> That's the only way I see it. Because this is not how we get the Holy Spirit today. We do not get the Holy Spirit today by the laying on of hands. 
How do we get the Holy Spirit today? Well, we saw in Acts 15, 11, that we believe that by grace through faith, or by grace we should be uh, through purifying their faith, uh, their hearts by faith. So this is for Gentiles. It's Ephesians' message of Ephesians 1, 13. Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he's in Ephesus right now. And what does he say to the Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 13? Gentiles... And Jews, I mean, Jews today have to be saved the same way that we are through the gospel. He says in Ephesians 1.13 that you're saved and you get the Holy Spirit when you believe. Let's go ahead and read Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. This is how we get the Holy Spirit today. It's not the laying on hands, it's not being baptized in water. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So Holy Spirit comes by believing. Now, what I've done is I've showed you in order these different ways that things took place. This is the last. So what we have to do, because Ephesians 1.13 is written after Acts 19, so what we need to do is we need to look at the book of Acts and we need to see the transition and not base our doctrine on something before. We have to say, all right, when was it finally settled? When was it finally in stone that from now on it's only this way that you get saved? And it's this right here. From now on, according to Paul, the only way to get the Holy Spirit is by believing in the gospel. It's no longer water baptism. It's no longer laying on of hands. It's when you believe the gospel, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, I hope I made that clear. Acts 19 is a hard book to get a hold of. Unless you understand that Acts chapter 19, the people that got it by the laying on of hands were Jews. And for some reason, they had to get it a different way because they, they went all the way back to this and they didn't go through the transition. They didn't see the transition. So Paul says, well, this is the only thing I know to do is go back to what they did back then and then you can finally come over here to where we are now. I wish I could explain it better, but I can't. There it is. Now, here's the other problem. Look at verse... Five, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, a lot of people say, Brother Breaker, and I get this question all the time. Brother Breaker, are we supposed to baptize people in water in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Lord? And this is where it comes from. Here, this is very different than Acts 2.38. Look at Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. And this is why... I don't like going to the book of Acts often because there's so many questions that arise in the book of Acts and so many arguments that you can get into in the book of Acts. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, there's no way to argue. You just see it the way it is. Hey, these guys were Jews. God had to deal with them a little bit differently for some reason or another because they were still back under John's ministry and that had to take place to get them over back over to Paul's ministry. But when you look at this, what did it say? It says there in Acts 19... Verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, Acts 2.38, look what Paul says. Then, or Peter says, excuse me. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So Peter baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul baptized these guys in the name of what? He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So one of them baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. The other is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so there are people out there that will argue, well, do you baptize in the name of Jesus Christ or the baptism in the name of the Lord? Or the Lord Jesus? Right. And they just want to argue. And you're just like, look, water baptism doesn't even save you. So what does it even matter? Go back to the words of Jesus now. In Matthew chapter 28. There are other people that say, well, Jesus said this. So do we baptize in this? So Matthew chapter 28 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> So you've got three different ways that somebody got baptized. Jesus tells them when they go out to the early uh, Jews and preach, they're supposed to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Did Peter do that? No, Peter baptized them in Acts 2.38. And what did he do? He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Where's the Holy Ghost and the Father? Why would you leave them out, Peter? Then Paul over here comes across 12 men that were Jews. And what does he do? Well, he doesn't obey Jesus. And he doesn't do it the same way Peter did. It says he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> I don't see a problem with any of those ways. I don't personally believe that you're saved by water baptism. So I do not preach salvation through water baptism. Now, after you get saved, 
People ask me all the time, Brother Breaker, I got saved. Can I be baptized in water? You can do whatever you want. There are a lot of churches out there that say, if you want to join our church, well, we require you to be baptized. And we ask you to do that because we believe that's a, uh, what is the word they, they show? That's a, it's a testimony. It's, it's you showing the church that you identify with the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, that you believe the gospel. So what is baptism? What's well, going down, underwater, and coming up. And that's a type of saying, I am buried with Christ, and I've risen to new, newness of life. So there are churches out there that want to baptize you in water. Some of them want you baptized in water because they say that's the only way to be saved. Those churches are heretical. They are not saved today by water baptism. Let me show you what Paul says. Let me prove that to you from Paul. Paul said he's our apostle. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's Corinth. He was just there not too long ago. He's in Ephesus. You go through these books that he's writing, and these are the questions that arise. And it makes sense why Paul would write these, because many of the letters of Paul that he's writing, the epistles, they're questions that the church had. So I'm sure the church is like, Paul, does water baptism save? And so what does Paul write back? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Why? Verse 18 says, because you're saved. The gospel is the power of God, by, whereby you're saved. So we're saved through the gospel. Look at verse uh, uh, 13. I thank God I baptized none of you. If we were saved today by water baptism, why would Paul say, thank God I didn't baptize those people? If water baptism saved, what would he be saying? Thank God they didn't get saved. What a dumb thing to say. So as you read the book of Acts and you see the transition and you see, wow, that doesn't seem to be good, you still you understand, well, we can't go by Acts 19. We've got to go by the rest of the, the books after Acts 19. We've got to understand Paul after Acts 19. And according to Paul, after Acts 19, he says you're saved by believing. You're by faith. And that he wasn't here to baptize in water. He was here to preach the gospel because the gospel is what saves. Now, do you want to get baptized in water after you're saved? You can help yourself. But it has nothing to do with saving you or keeping you saved. Okay? And a lot of times, like I said, it's to join a church. A lot of people want you to join a local church, and so they say you become a member of the local church by their baptism or whatever, and, and if you want to do something like that, you help yourself. But according to what we've already seen in Acts, there's another baptism other than the water baptism, and what is it? It's the Spirit baptism. We looked at that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, and that when you're saved, then you're baptized with the Holy Spirit the moment you believe. So the Spirit baptism is the most important. Uh, a lot of people, they say, Brother Breaker, you're a hyper-dispensationalist. No, I'm not. Hyper-dispensationalists say that you should never be baptized in water, and that it's not for this dispensation, not for this age. Okay. So they're very much against water baptism. I'm not. I tell people you can do whatever you, you want to do. What I want to make sure, though, is that you're not thinking that water baptism saves you. If you think you're saved by water baptism, then you're lost because you're trusting in your work. And as we've already seen in the book of Acts, it's not the works that saves us. So back to Acts chapter 19. Here's a troubling passage <laughs> because we're seeing the transition taking place of the different ways that people got the Holy Spirit and how it's changing from Jews to Gentiles, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, chapter 19, pretty late in the book of Acts, we see some Jews, and they get baptized twice in their life, and that didn't even save them. They didn't get the Holy Spirit until Paul laid their hands on them. What a weird situation. Well, it was some sort of situation that was only for them. It's not for us today. There were only 12 men that that took place with. That is not the gospel of salvation today. Be baptized twice, then let some guy uh, you know, put his hands on you to give you the Holy Spirit. That's not for us today. So that must have been some sort of special thing. Some sort of special thing because they were still under John, and they hadn't come over here yet. They didn't understand the transition. That's all I know how to do with that. Okay. Now we continue there. What happens next? Verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So... What does Paul do? He continues going to Jews. You see, a lot of guys, they'll come to the book of Acts and they'll just, they're called hyper dispensationalists because they'll look for a dispensation anywhere. And they'll come to the book of Acts and they'll just start going chop, 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 and chop it up and say, now this has to be here, this has to be here. And that's so hard because Acts 19. It's very hard to, to draw lines in the book of Acts and say, now this must be this. Because sometimes it's like, no. So that's why I say repeatedly, the book of Acts is a transitional book, and we're slowly seeing some things changing until finally it gets to the settled canon of Scripture, the settled doctrine 
of salvation, which is by faith alone in the blood atonement of Christ. And when you believe, Ephesians 1.13, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So Paul, though, he's going to Jews still. Now, some of your hyper-dispensationalists, they love to talk about how, I'm an Acts 19 uh, believer, or I'm an Acts 20 believer, or I'm an Acts 28, and, and I don't even know what they're talking about, to be honest with you. But they want to go to the book of Acts and say, I believe that in this chapter of the book of Acts, Paul is only going to uh, Gentiles, and that the gospel is set in stone in that chapter. And that's kind of hard to do. Because as we looked at last time, Remember what Paul says in Acts chapter 18 and verse 6? In Acts 18, 6, Paul says, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 18, Paul says, I'm done with you Jews. I'm only going to preach to Gentiles from now on. Is that what happened? No. The very next verse says, He entered into a man's house that lived right next to the synagogue. And then what is he doing? Well, as you continue reading there, he's going to synagogue. Look at verse 17, uh, the synagogue. Um, he, he continues going into the synagogues and preaching to Jews. So he just spoke in haste. He said, man, I'm only going to Gentiles because you Jews don't care. But what does he do? Well, he goes into the synagogue again to try to reach Jews. So Paul loves the Jewish people, and he's trying to reach them. So here we see in verse 8, and he went. so you can't say, I'm an Acts 18, or I believe Acts 18 is when Paul only went to the Gentiles from then on. You've just shown your ignorance. You're not a Bible believer because you're not even a Bible reader, because if you simply read it, Paul's still going and preaching to, to Jews. Matter of fact, all the way out to Acts chapter 28, <laughs> look at what Paul says. Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 28, he begins and begins talking to Jews. Um, let's see if I can find a good place to start here. Well, all right, verse 17, Acts 28, 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren. And then he begins to preach to the Jews. So you cannot say that Paul only goes to Gentiles his entire ministry, as some people say. The very last chapter of the book of Acts, Paul is preaching to Jews. And what happens? Well, they reject. And then verse 28 says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So Paul says, look, if you Jews don't want the truth, the Gentiles are going to accept it. But I don't see the ministry of Paul as a man going only to Gentiles. That is a ridiculous statement. If you read the Bible and study verse by verse that we're doing, everywhere Paul went, he went to the Jew first, then to the Greek, the Gentile. He wanted to see his people saved. And when he saw that they would reject it, then he'd go to the Gentiles to try to win them. So here Paul is in verse 8 of chapter 19 of the book of Acts. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So here he's preaching not only who Christ is. Remember we talked about the who message and the what message. Not only is he preaching the message of the early church, who Jesus is, believe he's the Messiah, he's teaching to them about what Jesus did, and now he's starting to talk to them about, about the kingdom of God, the K-O-G. Now the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I believe there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now some people say, well that's the dumbest thing I ever heard, this Robert Breaker, he's a moron, they're the same thing. <laughs> really? <coughs> no, no they're not. There's a physical kingdom and there's a spiritual kingdom. And I clearly see the difference. Now let's look at this. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, Paul tells us what the kingdom of God is. Romans 14, 17. And in Romans 14, 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is the definition of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual thing. It's about having the Holy Spirit. And when you get the Holy Spirit, you're a part of the kingdom of God. And you have God's righteousness imputed to you. And you're supposed to have joy. So the kingdom of God. Another definition, another place that defines the kingdom of God is Luke 17, 21. Luke 17, 21. Jesus Christ says in Luke 17, 21 these words. Verse 20 says, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Okay, so it's not something you can see. It's not physical. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. 
What is the kingdom of God? It's when inside your body, the Holy Spirit, which is God, the Bible says God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and dwells in you, guess what? You're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He cannot leave. It's sealed. There's no losing your salvation. Paul is very adamant, once saved, always saved. So that's the spiritual kingdom of God reigning inside of you, dwelling inside of you when you get saved. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It comes not with observation. Now what's the kingdom of heaven? Well, the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached. When Jesus comes back at Armageddon, he's going to set up the kingdom of heaven, the KOH. That's when he's going to reign literally. So I see a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Some people say, well, I don't see that right here. Okay. I think it's quite interesting that uh, the book of John never mentions the kingdom of heaven, only the kingdom of God. But the others, they, they, try to, they kind of use them interchangeably. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sometimes they'll say kingdom of God, sometimes kingdom of heaven, and it almost sounds like they're the same. Uh, some of the parables that Jesus gives, sometimes he says the kingdom of heaven is like this, and other times he says the kingdom of God is like this. And so people say, and he says the same thing, so they're both the same. No, they're just similar. They have a lot of the same things that are the same and similar in them. But according to the scriptures, we're told that the kingdom of God is the spiritual kingdom within. And the kingdom of heaven, why well, that's going to be the physical kingdom of of, of God when, when Jesus Christ comes and sits on the throne of David and literally reigns for a thousand years in the millennium. So I, I do see a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So Paul is talking about the kingdom of God here. Now let's continue. Verse 9, But when divers were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of of one Tyrannus. <laughs> now here's a school mentioned, and it's connected with unsaved Greek people. It must be some sort of a Greek school. And I like the name of this guy. Actually, I don't like the name of this guy. I think it's interesting. The name of the guy is Tyrannus. <laughs> that sounds a lot like the word tyrant. What is a tyrant? Someone that says, I'm right and you're wrong, and you have to do what I say and obey me. <laughs> That's a tyrannical person. So somehow or another, he got to go to a school and to sit down and speak in this school. So Paul becomes a school teacher, and he begins to teach and to preach the law. So the Jews kick him out, and so he spends some time teaching in a school. Now, verse 10, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So both Jews and Greeks heard the word of the Lord. The Word of the Lord is what we now have as the Bible. The Word of the Lord is these books of Paul. Remember, Paul wrote Romans to Philemon. So Romans to Philemon, and I believe he wrote the book of Hebrews, but I believe he wrote Hebrews first. And that's what we call the Word of God today. Now the book of Acts is also part of the Word of God, our Bible, our canon. So Paul is out there preaching his doctrine. And if you want to know what his doctrine is, the, the doctrine for the church today, read Romans through Philemon, read Hebrews. Verse 11, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Alright, so here we see Paul having some special miracles. Remember, I told you earlier, everything Peter does in the early book of Acts, Paul does the exact same thing. Peter and the early apostles had miracles. Paul had miracles. Peter and the early apostles, they win Jews to the Lord. Paul wins Jews to the Lord. I mean, there's, there's so many things. Uh, Peter uh, heals a man that's crippled. Paul heals a man that's crippled. And you just see, uh, Peter is put in jail, and God lets him escape. Paul gets in jail, and there's an earthquake. And, and Paul, Paul's able to escape, but he doesn't. He stays there and wins the jailer to the Lord. But while they're in jail, God does some sort of supernatural miracle to help them escape. So I find it very, and I mean very, interesting to see this how Paul does the same things that Peter does. And I don't understand why that is always, except for the fact that it just must be uh, that God is showing you, look, Paul should be in the Bible. Paul is one of the apostles. Follow Paul. Now, Paul gets these special miracles. He gets a miracle that not even the, the others have. You see, Peter could lay hands on people and heal them, and, and he could do things. Well, Paul didn't even have to put his hand on somebody. He could heal someone from a distance. Look what it says. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick 
handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases parted from them. All a person had to do was mail a handkerchief or mail some of their clothing, an article of clothing to Paul. And when Paul touched it, wherever that person was, they were instantly healed. Now, does that take place today? There are people on the, on the boob tube, on TV, that have their little so-called Christian stations and their Pentecostals, their Charismatics, and they say, send me your handkerchief in the mail and $500 and you will be healed of your disease. You liar. You deceiver. You reprobate. You're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Signs, the Bible says, are for Jews. 1 Corinthians 1.21, Paul says, For the Jews seek after a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. Paul tells us that there are what's called the signs of the apostles, and that these signs <clears throat> were being able to heal people. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul says, Surely the signs of apostles were wrought among you. Uh, Hebrews 6, verse 1 through 3, Paul says, There are some things that we do, and I like how Paul says it, These we will do if God permit. Paul is beginning to understand, Look, he's taking me more to Gentiles than Jews, and Jews need a sign. But the signs are more for the Jews. So Paul is doing signs. God gave him these signs. Paul was an apostle. He had the signs of the apostle. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 10. Paul talks about how he was one born out of due season. And how he had the signs of the apostle. But when you look at the very end of the ministry of Paul. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know what you find? Paul couldn't do these miracles anymore. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. This 2 Timothy would be the last book that Paul wrote. The last whole entire book that Paul wrote. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 20, we read, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Paul is with a man, Trophimus, and yet he has to leave that man, and he can't heal that man, he leaves that man sick. Now how is that possible if in this part, Acts 19, the Bible says that Paul had such special miracles that he didn't even have to touch a person or be with a person. All you had to do is give them an article of their clothing, and when he touched their clothing, that person was healed. Why would Paul leave a man sick at the end of his ministry? Did he just not like him and say, well, I could heal you, but you made me mad, so I'm just going to let you be sick? No. You see, the signs of the apostles were that. They were for the apostles. Paul was the last apostle. And the signs were more for Jews. because So when Paul got to the end of his ministry, God says, okay, I'm not going to have any more signs. From now on, you've got to believe by faith. And that would make sense why Paul says, for the just shall live by faith. And why he said, well, we, we live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't have apostles today. We don't have the miracles today. We don't need them. Because they were so that the Jews would believe. So I don't believe in apostles today. You can go to YouTube, look up my video on Are There Apostles Today? I don't believe we need signs and wonders today. Go to YouTube, uh, look at my other video entitled The Signs of the Apostles. And I'll show you how there were indeed times in which there were healings and things like that. But I don't believe that men have those gifts anymore. I believe God can heal. If you want to get healed and you got a disease, pray to God, ask Him to heal you. But don't go look for some man to lay hands on you and think he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He might just give you a different spirit, a demon. Because the Bible says that in the last days we better watch out. Because that the devil has lying signs and wonders. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, this would be at the after Paul died even. And it's all these churches in Asia. And, and John, the apostle, is writing to them about 90 to 96 AD. And he says... Uh, thou hast done well. He says, you've tried them which say they're apostles and are not and found them liars. There are people running around saying, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. And John says, no, they're not. They're liars. John says, I'm the last apostle. He was the one that lived the longest of all the apostles. So I don't believe in special gifts and things like that today. I don't believe in the signs and the wonders. I believe that they were for a time. And I believe that they're for Jews. <clears throat> Paul then goes to the Gentiles after. Another example is 1 uh, Timothy 5.23, where Paul says, Have a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmity medicine. All right, so I, I need to finish this up. So let's go ahead and continue, if we can, all the way down to verse 20, and then we'll start again next time in verse 20. So as we continue here, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief, priest, and chief of the priests, which did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> when I think of this story, and I hear this story, this is an exorcism. There's a lot of priests out there, Catholic priests, that believe in doing exorcism. Do the Catholic priests have the Holy Spirit? No. No, the Bible says you get the Holy Spirit when you believe the Gospel. Well, they don't believe that. They believe in their doctrine of their church. They don't believe you have the Holy Spirit. So, I've heard story after story of people having a demon and then calling a, a Catholic priest. And the Catholic priest comes in to do an exorcism and things like this happen to them. The Catholic priest comes out and his clothes all ripped and he's like, I can't do anything here. I always think of that when I read this passage. So what did they do? Well, these guys were lost Jews, and they said, well, I don't know what to do, so in the name of Paul and Jesus, come out of him. And the demons go, well, we know Paul, we know Jesus, we don't know you. And the demons beat the snot out of them, and they came out with their clothes all ripped up, half naked, or maybe even completely naked, and wounded. So I think that's interesting. Now what happened, verse 17, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on, all, on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Why was the name of the Lord Jesus magnified? Because the demons knew who Jesus was. So people began to understand, wow, if you have Jesus, and you're saved by Jesus, then the demon can't overcome you. John says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, sealed in you, and you can't lose it. I get so frustrated going and listening to these people. Uh, contact me all the time. People contact me saying, Brother Breaker, um, I'm a Christian, but I'm afraid I have a demon. What should I do? They talk about deliverance ministries. They say, well, I'm a Christian, but I went to a deliverance ministry to get rid of a demon. Uh, no, you didn't. If you're saved, how can you have a demon? If you are saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is sealed inside of you. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How does a demon break that seal and come inside of a believer? I don't see how. Does the Holy Spirit sit there with a demon and they just kind of look at each other? No, I have a God, the Holy Spirit, in me. And those things cannot come into me. Now, they can't possess me. Now, they can oppress me. So, there's a thing called a demonic oppression where from outwardly they can try to attack Christians. But I do not see in the Bible anywhere where a born-again child of God, saved by faith in the blood, could ever have a demon. So if someone claims to be a Christian, but they have a demon, they must be lost. So here we continue here, and it says here, verse 18, And many that believed came and confessed, showed their deeds, and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them, and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Meant much more that I could say about this, but I find it very interesting. This takes place, and then, like, the whole city of Ephesus is like, wow, wow, we, we better get rid of our curious arts. What is a curious art? Well, curious arts, well, that's witchcraft. So much of the city was overcome with witchcraft. And we see a little bit of a revival here through the name of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ the Lord. And he's magnified. And these people come and they, they get rid of their witchcraft. In that day, many people in Ephesus knew what a demon was. Everybody knew there were demons. We live in a day and age in which people don't think there's such a thing as demons. I get phone calls from people all the time. Uh, emails, Brother Breaker, there's a demon bothering me. I hear voices. I hear this. I, I say, well, they're real. Well, just plead the blood of Jesus. Quote King James Scripture. Uh, quote the Gospel. Say, thank you, Jesus, for being God manifest in the flesh and dying for my sins. And they'll flee. And they do. Demons hate the blood of Jesus Christ. Once again, must have been the message of Paul. Faith in the blood of Christ. And so this whole thing came together. Now, what is witchcraft? I don't want to get into that. I don't have time. I'll just, as quickly as I can, explain Witchcraft is when you communicate with demons. And it's called curious arts because people get curious. And they say, well, I'm curious. There's probably out there spirits. So I'm curious what they are, who they are. I want to get to know them. So I'm going to do a Ouija board or I'm going to do a mantra in meditation or I'm going to do this and then wait until they contact me and I'm just curious about them. So I just want to know more. That is evil. That is awful. That is wicked. We should stay away from demons completely. And so this city... Much of this city said, forget it. And they burned all of their books on witchcraft, so much so that it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. 
Now that's a lot of silver, 50,000 pieces of silver. To this day, uh, well this is going to be a little high, but this will be the best way I know how. Uh, one, one piece of silver, one ounce of silver is probably worth about $20. Okay, If you had 50,000 pieces of silver, whew, that's a lot of money. Now, a piece of silver was usually one-tenth of an ounce. So, let's take a tenth of an ounce, that'd be $2. 50,000 pieces of silver, okay, let's, uh, let's, what would that be? $2 a piece, that'd be $100,000. $100,000 worth of that. Now, now, that's in today's money. Go back then, how much was it worth? A lot more. Um, one little drachma, a tenth of an ounce silver, was worth a day's wage. A day's wage today is about $100. So let's add 100 to 50,000. What does that come up to? Uh, 50,000, is it $5 million? I mean, I'm not that great with math. But we're looking at a whole lot of money going down the tubes here because the people did not want demons and they didn't want witchcraft and they said, we're done. And they burned them. What's sad to me is to see the United States of America people turning to witchcraft, people turning to demonic curious arts and spells and and watching Harry Potter and and people say oh I want to be a witch and I, and I and it's just disgusting it's just disgusting we need more revival so I might the word of God and prevail so we'll stop there in verse 20 next time we'll start in verse 21 went a little long today but I hope it's been a blessing to you I hope you uh, get an idea of uh, the uh, missionary journeys of Paul I want you to see these seven different ways that a person got the Holy Spirit and how Today, we're the last one. We're the Ephesians 1.13. We're the way that it finally settled with Paul with the Gentiles. These are the different cities Paul journeyed to and how we get our Bible from Paul. I hope it's been a blessing. We'll see you next time in Acts chapter 19. God bless.